It's November in South Wales. The leaves have fallen and the ground is wet with rain. Rob has been working in Strawberry Cottage Wood for eight weeks now and his life has adjusted to the new routine. Winter has arrived. The weather has turned pretty ferocious. There's a mean wind out of the northwest blowing. It's very cold. And I'm taking a bucket of feed over to the pigs. They've been in the woods for six weeks. And this has become part of my daily ritual, come rain or shine. In October, Rob picked up two Tamworth pigs, hoping they would clear an area of bracken and brambles along one edge of the wood. Here, little pigs, it's breakfast. This ground has been heavily dug up and it's like a mire in Flanders fields now. Come on, chaps. Up we come. Oh, my word, it's very, very muddy. So this was bracken and brambles above head height. And you can see the extraordinary change that they've already made. Uh, and it's through a very simple process of throwing their feed into here. And they root and scramble about for their pig rolls and thereby trample over and tread and churn up this. You only have to look at these animals to know how effective they're going to be in here. 600 kilos of rotivator. The pigs have cleared an area the size of a tennis court. Get in there. They are guided by their sense of smell, which is a thousand times more sensitive than humans. We've used them for centuries to hunt truffles, and more recently to sniff out explosives and drugs. We're not doing anything original here. The ancestors of these pigs will have worked in British woodlands for, well, at least a thousand years. And in a sense, they are designed for this job, for rooting on the forest floor. In the heart of Strawberry Cottage Wood, the bare branches allow sunlight to hit the woodland floor. For the first time, Rob can see out of the trees. What causes the transformation in the wood at this time of year is the sap falling. So the leaves have come off the trees, they've tumbled down to the ground, and the sap is in retreat to the heart of the tree. The tree is preparing itself for winter. And this is a call to arms for the woodsman. The winter is the time for industry in the woods. If Rob is to make this woodland work, the next four months are critical. Now is the time when timber can be harvested and the heavy work carried out. So when I took over this wood at the end of summer, I didn't really know what was here. So thick was the canopy and so dense was the vegetation. But at this time of year, the character of the woodland begins to reveal itself. So what I discovered is that there is a lot of this, hazel coppices, and there are also a lot of standards, big old growth oak and ash trees. And that suggests that the wood was managed using a system called coppice with standards, a woodland management system that has been popular in Britain since the Middle Ages. Coppice with standards allows big standard trees such as oak to grow tall and supply large amounts of high quality timber. In between these are smaller trees such as hazel which are cut back or coppiced more regularly and they are wood used for fuel. Perfected over centuries this technique allowed a permanent forest to exist whilst providing a never-ending supply of woodland products to the community. 
But in the 21st century, our coppicing only continues in a few remaining woodlands. To learn the skills of a coppice worker, Rob has come to Western Burt Arboretum, where Brian Williamson has been restoring a much larger hazel wood. Oh. Brian, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? Good morning. Good. Good. Welcome, uh, to, welcome to the Western Burt Woods. Oh, thank you very much. Well, lovely to be here. So, Brian, how, how has this happened? Why, why is it fallen out of management and well, turned into this wood? Uh, it, it's simple economics, really. Um, Labour charges went up in the 20th century. Yeah. Cheap plastics, mass production came in, so you could buy uh, steel products, plastic products very cheaply, and people stopped buying wood. And as soon as you take the, the money out of it, there's no reason for people to, to manage them. Our coppiced woods were once the oil fields of Britain. Since Roman times, they have supplied local industries with millions of tons of charcoal. Many counties also had their own regional industry. Sussex supported communities of clog makers. Hampshire provided millions of fence posts and gates. And up until the 1970s, bark from oak coppice supported the Cumbrian tanning industry. Brian and Rob need to find a modern-day market for their products. But in an abandoned coppice, the quality of the timber quickly deteriorates. What you've got is nothing but a bit of low-value firewood in here. Um, for good quality coppice, you want straight poles, because most of the market is in things like hurdling rods, binders for hedge laying, stakes for hedge laying, things like that. That's they where the money demand. is. That's, that's where the money in hazel coppice is. So you want these straight poles by, the, the, straight by the hundreds? Poles. Yes, if not the thousands. To create a productive coppice takes many years of cutting. The area Brian first cut ten years ago is only just returning to its original productivity. So what we've got here, Rob, and what we're working on is coppice that we cut six years ago. OK. So when you look at this stool, yeah. and the stool is basically the base of the, the tree after it's been cut down, you're looking at stems six years old yeah. coming back from the cut stump. So you can see how the production is beginning to go up. Um, we're getting more rods per stool, and this will keep happening every time we cut it. The new rods have grown back at almost triple the density. But Rob must also learn how each piece of wood can be used. Good enough for a pea stick. So is the top of that good enough for a pea stick? So I've got a piece of hazel now. Uh, that, yes, that would probably do. Just about? That would probably so do. So I want to take it off back here? Um, you want about five feet. Five feet of it, OK. Yeah. There's an old adage in woodworking about keeping everything as long as you can for as long as you can because you never quite know what you're going to use it for and if you cut it down to length too soon you might lose the the best use of it my eyes have been open to the extraordinary variety of products that you get out of here there are bean poles poles for tomato sticks and other stuff you know material for making hurdles and that's all from this area of hazel coppice, all cut with that. Coppicing doesn't just produce timber. It also prolongs the life of the tree. And at Westonbert, Brian has the perfect illustration. This is coppice management at its best and its most long-lived. Uh, and this lime which is one tree, or was one tree, is thought to have been coppiced for a, around 2,000 years. Really? Uh, it's been DNA tested to be a single specimen. Could have been a Roman soldier who coppiced this the first time round. Extraordinary. And we're standing in the middle of one tree, and look at it. It's kind of 20, 30 feet all around us. 
But people are always concerned. You cut something down, you kill it. Yeah. Yet cutting this down repeatedly is what's kept it going, because lime isn't an especially long-lived tree of its own accord, you know, two or three hundred years. And yet this one's been going 2,000 years, solely because it's been regularly cut. Gosh, isn't that fantastic? Every 25 years since the time of Julius Caesar, this tree has been cut down. Its bark used to make rope, its trunk made into scaffolding poles and fence posts. And at every cut, the aging process is reset, allowing the tree to continue to grow for two millennia. They say that the first conservationists were woodsmen, and that, you know, woods were managed sustainably long before the word was invented. Now, that's because of the self-renewing property of trees. And people recognised this long ago, that if you managed woods well, they carried on producing the products that you wanted and could use. And that really is at the heart of the whole story of woodland management in Britain. Back in Strawberry Cottage Wood, it is time to put Brian's advice into practice. And to help get him started, Rob has called in the local woodland group. So, thank you very much all for coming. The job we're going to do today is we're going to coppice some of the old hazel stools. As you can see, they're all very old, they haven't been touched for ages, it's going to be quite tangly to take down. But there's plenty of wood in there for whatever we propose to do with it afterwards. The hazel stools dominate the top part of the wood. They have not been touched for over 50 years. By coppicing them, Rob will remove the large overgrown stems and let new straighter shoots grow up from the base. So you're doing well with me. I, I, I'm surprised how fast they've gone on with it. How quickly we cleared the patch. Oh. If we could have all these people every day, we wouldn't be long about. We'd be out of the wood and gone. There are over 750 woodland groups in Britain. They manage over 100,000 acres of woodland. Many of this group will get their firewood from these stools. A huge amount of wood is coming out, so this pile here is all hazel and this will be used in due course to make charcoal. So we're s stacking it up here because we're gonna bring the kiln to this part of the wood, probably to right here, this exact spot, I suspect. Piles of the brash, this is all the sort of top of the hazel copper, so you can't do much with it. It'll be habitat for birds, ground nesting birds at some point. And then beginning to get a clearing. So suddenly we've got some sky into the wood so it's beginning to take shape you know and suddenly you know it looks like a woodland under management for the first time in a very long time which is very exciting By the end of the day, the group has cleared six stools and the woodland has changed dramatically. But overnight, the Welsh winter closes in and it's a very different scene the next morning. It was an incredibly cold night last night. It was down to minus 10, people are saying. And so I'm hoping that a little bit of activity in the wood will warm me up nicely. There are still over 150 hazel stools in the top part of the wood. And from now on, Rob is working on his own. It is extraordinary how much timber comes out of each individual stool. 
And in terms of what we plan to coppice in this bit of the wood, I've, you know, we've only just begun. For the next three weeks, Rob must work hard. These trees can be a vital source of income. November turns into December, and after days of blisters and aching joints, Rob slowly develops a rhythm to his coppicing. If you want to learn about woods, you have to get involved. You have to work. By Christmas, a substantial clearing has been created and Rob's work has produced a much larger pile of timber than expected. I started making this series to encourage people back into woodland management, but the reality is, if we all produced as much wood as I am, the market for bean poles and pea sticks or whatever would be flooded. I can't help but wonder if there isn't another way that we could be using all this wood. Finding a modern use for coppice timber is vital if Rob is to make money from the wood. In Carmarthenshire, two men have spent almost a quarter of a century trying to solve this puzzle. Bill Owens and Richard Edwards manage 65 acres of birch and willow coppice outside Llandelo in West Wales. They believe they have found a new role for woodlands which otherwise would be neglected. The one issue over the next 20 years is all fossil fuels are going to increase in price. There's no way the price of oil is ever going to come down. There's no, yeah. no way the price of gas will ever come yeah. down. Yeah. What we have in place of that is wood which we can use. Woodlands like Richard's would have once provided the local village with firewood and fuel. In the 19th century, cheap coal and oil replaced these, but Richard now believes he's found a way to bring wood fuel back into use. We have a process here where we're able to produce a completely new type of wood fuel, okay. which offers real increased efficiencies. Wood has been overlooked as a fuel because it is heavy to transport and has a low burning temperature. Richard's idea is that by drying the wood for eight hours in a wood-fired oven, you can create a lighter and more efficient fuel. This is all about taking the water content yeah. out we of remove, the wood. We remove the water and it, becomes, it just becomes a much more efficient fuel. Um, you know, it lights easier. It, carries easier um, and you, know, you get you just get much much more out of it per per ton we have probably in the whole of britain half a million acres at least of unmanaged woodland yep. which is absolutely full to the top of small useless roundwood here is its end use. We haven't any doubt at all it will end up as a profitable end product. Richard's idea is that our small woodlands could play a role in meeting our future energy demands. And by doing so, we could bring thousands of acres of neglected wood back under management. So this is the end product. Yep, it's had eight hours um, of a gentle roast and we have a product which is wood which has no water in it at all uh, we can run a test with a moisture meter and we should prove the issue that so it's flashing between naught and one and two percent yeah yeah it is one of the most efficient fuels in the world. Normal seasoned firewood is 25% water. 
Richard's drying technique removes this, making it both lighter and more efficient as a fuel. So the beauty of this whole process is the simplicity. The only thing we don't know is just how hot this wood burns. But Dave, Richard's engineer, Dave, how you doing? Fine, fine. He's going to show me. Can we stick that one on? We'll give it a go. Fantastic. Burning normal hazel like this would create temperatures of around 200 degrees centigrade. So how hot will this get, Dave? It could get close to 400 degrees C. What? Yeah. But we try to hold it back because that is getting quite hot. That's phenomenal. Richard has indeed transformed his coppice from waste wood into an almost smokeless superfuel. What's intriguing about this is that it's a return to the way that coppice wood has been used for centuries, providing local communities with local wood. Can it work commercially now? I just don't know. But certainly I'd like to give it a go in spring and see if I can provide my local woodland group with fuel. Back in Strawberry Cottage Wood, the coppicing work continues. The wood is changing, but months working alone is also having an effect on Rob. Far away from the madness of men. Months under the canopy is bringing out his inner woodsman. They say the proximity of the past is close in woodlands. I suppose that's something to do with the fact that they haven't changed in thousands of years. <laughs> and somehow that reconnects us with the human matrix with nature. Rob is experiencing what many people feel in the woods. They are our main lines to nature, places we can escape to. Whereas once we all lived within them, nowadays only a few people remain, and they have a unique relationship with the trees. I live Simi has spent 25 years living in a cabin in a small woodland in North Wales. Rob is here to learn the unique approach to management that ILIF has developed. Oh, my lord. It's the size of a tree. ILIF. Dr. Livingston, I presume. <laughs> Good morning, sir. <laughs> nice to meet you. Come and have some coffee. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. What a beautiful piece of wood. Nyliff's dream has been to restore the natural balance that existed here long before humans were around. I'm restoring the woodland as a whole, the complete ecosystem. That's the special feature of this valley. It has no economic value, but it has an immense value as a demonstration of how the natural forest works in the British climate. I'm like a doctor or a, a, a nurse giving a helping hand in restoring the woodland. But the woodland should eventually stand on its own feet. If we get the conditions right, nature will take off. Eilif employs a woodsman to carry out work normally done by nature. Today, he is cutting the branches off a tree to leave only the trunk remaining. Here, 
when Paul has cut the top off, what what are you left with? The decaying trunk that's standing there. What, 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 which will be dead and then begins to decay? Yes. Uh, right. We want okay. it to decay because all sorts of creepy crawlies will live in there, from spiders to earwigs and so on. And these are, these are food for many of the birds, especially the woodpeckers. In a natural woodland, it would require 25 of these to the acre and, and of a bigger diameter to match a natural woodland. OK, so that's to provide so habitat in, tw for... in 20 acres, you see, I should have over 100 of these. Yeah. I don't have nothing like. Right, right. Eilif's priority is not to create a wood that delivers timber, but one which provides a rich home for local plants and animals. So my instinct probably would have been to fell this tree, tree completely. But of course, by doing it this way, what you've done is taken a lot of the wood off the top. And what you're left with is this standing trunk which is going to decay slowly over years. And that will become a wildlife hotel. But Eilif's wood also has another role. It provides refuge to a man who has suffered huge loss in his lifetime. I've had some really low moments in my life. Perhaps the greatest was when my younger son died of leukemia. And it took three and a half years. And I was living here. And I found this, the, the woodland. Sorry. <laughs> It's quite difficult, it starts mm. coming back. It's mm. good for me, brings it out. The woodland took me in, in its arms, in its fold, and healed me all the time. I think if I hadn't had the woodland, I might well have crashed. But I still get moments when I feel very vulnerable. I find the best thing to do is break off and come out and work in the woodland for half a day. When I go back to the house for a cup of tea or whatever, I'm healed. I'm back to normal again. Rob's work has also had its own healing role. My dad died very suddenly towards the end of last year, and I was surprised at how little time I had to uh, think about him, think about my relationship with him, and, you know, go through the process of grieving. And I found that by coming to the woods, I was provided that time. You know, there is a sort of cathedral aspect to being in an ancient wood. And so it was, for me, very powerful. And I was very grateful, you know, that I had the wood to go to, to, to think about Dad and go through the whole grieving process. New Year comes around, and the weather begins to warm. In Strawberry Cottage Wood, it has now been two months since the pigs first arrived. Their time here is at an end, and their owner, Ray Harris, has come to pick them up. So this is where we've been feeding them most recently, Ray. Yeah, it does look a lot different to what it did before. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was an you know, overhead thicket of bracket, yeah. bracken and brambles. They've done a fantastic job. You know, they've cleared whole areas, Ray. Yeah. Oh, look, here's, here she is, here she is. Come see you, Ray. I know, I know. We've been, oh, she's looking good too, isn't she? 
Will you miss them when they go? I will, you know. I will. Yeah. I'll particularly miss him. Yeah. I mean, he's... Well, been... he's a character, he isn't he? He's a great character. Yeah. He's been very, very companionable. Yeah. He always... I mean, I know, you know, I'm always turning up with a bucket of feed, but he always looks genuinely pleased to see me. Uh, so, wh when you take them away, what happens next, Ray? Well, I'm afraid it's off to the abattoir for him. Oh, is it right? Oh. I'm afraid so. Oh, God. Um, I suppose that's the natural course of things, isn't it? But, uh... Let's see, yeah. It'd yeah. be a shame, because yeah. they're great creatures. <laughs> <laughs> quite sad they've gone you know I miss them at two levels you know they they worked hard they did the hard yards in the wood they cleared large area uh, and for that service I'm very grateful but they were also very good companions you know I look forward to coming to see them each day and you know you spend a lot of time on your own in the woods and they were there and you you know develop a relationship with them you know they're really very friendly and we are now pigless wood again next time at strawberry cottage wood rob is off to explore britain's timber industry they cut more timber here in an hour than i've coppiced in an entire winter he tries to fell trees in his own wood. Could be fireworks now. And persuade local experts to buy them. Oh, who cut this? Who cut this like that? What a waste. <laughs>